So welcome back to the second session of Morrison Forster and Nucleate Advanced Topics in Patent Law course. We had a great session last week and we look forward to continuing these discussions over the next several weeks. Today's session is gonna focus on small molecule patent drafting and IP strategies. And it's gonna be led by my partner and good friend, uh, Anita Choi. Before we start, a few housekeeping items for everybody. Uh, you will all have access to Anita's slides. Um, you'll be able to download, downloads after the, download those slides after the presentation. Uh, you'll receive an email on that. Remember that we are offering free office hours uh, for all attendees of the course. So if you have questions about careers in patent law, specific IP questions that you'd like to ask in a confidential setting, uh, questions about anything, uh, we're happy to, to do that. So you'll have a, receive an email um, after the presentation, which will show you how to sign up for those. We welcome your questions during the presentation. I'll be monitoring the uh, questions and I'll interrupt Anita and make sure that she gets your questions answered. A lot of you have already sent in questions, which are really uh, a great way for us to address those. Anita will be addressing several of those today. If you have any te technical difficulties during the presentation, please email Nora Moore at nmore at mofo.com. Um, there are other topics that you'd like us to, to, to discuss in the future, please uh, let us know. So with that, I introduce Anita Choi. Anita? Hi, everyone. Thank you for attending this session. Uh, I'm here today to talk about small molecule patent drafting and IP strategy um, for this type of technology. Um, by way of background, I'm a chemist by training. Uh, I went to Caltech and I, I did a lot of research in both uh, organic and inorganic chemistry and ended up going into industry for a couple years at Pfizer doing some drug development work. Um, and since I've been at the firm, I've had the pleasure of working on a lot of different technologies, some of them small molecule, but also ranging to um, other technologies as well. But today I'm talking about small molecule work and um, we'll start from there. Here we go. So as you have heard from the other talks, you know, patents are uh, an exclusionary right. It is a governmental right um, that you get to exclude others for a certain period of years. And in order to get that exclusionary right, there are certain requirements um, to get that patent. And I've outlined five of the key requirements, um, predominantly based on US law, but the, these requirements in some shape or form uh, are also effective in other foreign jurisdictions as well. Um, and those requirements include the subject matter at stake, um, the utility of the invention, the novelty and non-obviousness of the invention, as well as written description and enablement. Um, and these are five of the basic categories for patentability. And so we'll touch on how this plays out for small molecule cases. So I'd like to start off with this slide because I often get questions about the patenting process. And I just wanna spend a minute here so that we can lay this out out and, and give you one timeline um, about how patent application process can unfold. So oftentimes you hear people talking about a U.S. provisional, uh, or this is the priority application, and this is what we call T equals zero. And in that process, um, you, you put a filing uh, with the patent office, and you have up to one year to do something with that priority application. And then at that 12-month mark, you'll hear people talk about a PCT application or a conversion. Um, and that is, this is the version of a patent application that ultimately gets examined. And between here to here, it's zero to 12, you have the opportunity to potentially pack in some more data or information about your invention. And from that point forward, the application gets locked down and a series of events will happen after T equals 12, one of which is the publication, which has implications on strategy as a whole. And I'll unpack that as we talk about how to think about IP strategy. But the other critical date is the 30 month, 
because the application, a PCT application that's filed here doesn't necessarily um, mean anything in the sense that you don't actually get that examined per se. You actually have to file that application in individual patent offices. Um, and that deadline happens at T equals 30. And this overall timeline is, is adopted by many companies because it does give you a chance to stretch out sort of the costs that could be incurred associated with patenting that whole process. So this is just a first sort of glimpse at the timeline, and then we can unpack why some of these dates are important to the overall strategy. So to first start off with, um, I want to just talk about the sections of a patent, just so that everyone is familiar. Hopefully in signing up for this, you've at least looked at and picked up a patent, a US patent, and flipped through. Um, just to kind of orient you, the patent number is typically on the top right-hand corner. Um, this particular patent is a special one. It's a reissue, um, and we, we, can, we can unpack what that means. But generally, the patent number is found at the top right-hand corner. There's the title, inventors, assignee owner. Then there's some details about the, the patent application. And then there's typically an abstract. So this is sort of the cover of the patent. And then you dive into some key sections that are required um, in patent applications, such as the background, um, the summary of the invention. And then there's a section called detailed description, which really dives into the invention and the contours of, of what that invention is about. There's also an example section, and you'll find this in many of the life sciences cases and small molecule cases as no, as no exception to that. Um, and in the example section, in small molecule cases, you'll find information about the synthesis of different compounds um, and the use in different assays and biological assays to show activity. And then we get to probably the most important section that most patent practitioners will flip to first, which is at the very back of the patent, and this is the claims. And the claims are ultimately what define the scope of exclusivity in a patent. The claims are what you go back and forth with in the patenting uh, process with the patent offices and the examiners. This is the language that ultimately gets scrutinized when you go through litigation, patent litigation, to figure out, does someone infringe on my patent or not? So a lot of the discussion today is focused on how to think about the claim strategy for small molecule cases. Okay. So I start here with just an example. Uh, and this is a, an example that we'll use for the purposes of illustrating some of the concepts um, in, in this talk. All right. So we focused in on Crestor, and here's the, the, the compound for Crestor. And then in terms of method of use, it's about lowering cholesterol. And this is the label for Crestor that I pulled up online. Um, and the reason we put this up is because it's really important to keep your eye on, you know, what is the commercial product, right? Um, this is a commercial drug that we're talking about. And most clients that we work with in the small molecule uh, space are busy developing and selecting candidates and pushing them through the clinical pipeline um, to get them onto the market. And so there's always a question of what will that label ultimately be? Because this label has a lot of information, has information in subsequent pages on the, the active ingredient itself, um, but also on the indications and usages and other sort of dosage information, dosing regimen information. So it has a lot of um, useful information that starts uh, giving us ideas about potential filings um, that surround a small molecule uh, blockbuster compound. Um, and so if you kind of go through the label, here's the section of the label that talks about the actual um, uh, Crestor compound, um, which is a calcium salt of this, of this structure. Okay, and so that's important to know and have a pulse on as you think about um, the, the IP portfolio that is built around this program. So now we're going to just pause for a minute um, and talk about this concept of genus versus species as we think about how to develop um, a strategy or IP strategy around uh, that compound that we saw that is Crestor. So let's start with making sure everyone is on the same page page about what is a genus claim versus what is a species claim. So a genus is something, it's a formula that can cover multiple species or compounds. 
So this is an example. This genus where you have different variables, the R variables here, that get defined subsequently, covers a large number of compounds. And this is in contrast to a species claim, which is the compound itself, right? And so you always want to think about the role of genus coverage and species coverage and, you know, what, what subject matter and what scope of subject matter you're going after. Okay, some things about genus and species. A species in a prior art publication will anticipate a claim to a genus, but the reverse is not always true. Um, the other thing is that, you know, whether or not the, the genus formula is anticipated has to do with whether you can really figure out from the disclosure that species can be put together. Okay, and there's a lot of case law that's around, uh, around that concept. Um, I put here a citation to the MPEP, and this is the manual um, for the patent examination process. This is the this is sort of the guidelines that um, the patent examiners rely on to help them through the process and try to main, maintain, maintain consistency at the patent office. So uh, us as patent practitioners will often go to the MPEP to kind of get guidance on um, how the patent office sees the various issues related to patentability. Okay, so that's the link here. But the main idea is that a species will anticipate a genus, but the reverse is not always true. Now, another um, sort of uh, technique or, 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 or concept that needs to be uh, talked about, especially with small molecule, molecule cases, is this concept of Marcouche type claims. And some of you may have heard or have used that, but I wanna make sure everyone is on the same page about what that concept is. Marcouche type claims is basically a way of expressing alternatives in a particular format. So the Marcouche language is specifically something is selected from the group consisting of A, B, and C. And that's the precise kind of magical words to say this is a Marcouche of A, B, and C. But you can also technically rewrite that language and just use more plain English and say R is A, B, or C. Okay, so these are just different drafting techniques to express alternatives. Okay, and I think that's important in small molecule cases because we deal with a lot of alternatives through the R variables um, in our genuses. So just want to make sure everybody's comfortable and, and familiar with that terminology. Another drafting uh, concept that I want to get out there is this concept of dependent claims, independent versus dependent claims. And for a moment, I'm just going to go back to the example that I had here. Um, you'll see here, we start with one, two, three, four. And this is your independent claim. It doesn't make reference to any earlier claim because it is the first claim of the claim set. But you'll see here uh, for claim two, it references back to claim one. Claim three references back to claim two, and so on and so forth. So these claims are dependent off of an earlier claim. And by definition, those dependent claims have to be narrower in scope. Otherwise, they are not a proper dependent claim. Okay. There will be also times where in drafting, um, you'll see multiple dependencies, meaning the, the claim, claim two could have said, or maybe claim four could have said any one of claims one to three. And that would, that would mean that this claim narrows one, narrows two, and narrows three, and it's dependent off of multiple claims. That type of uh, construction is something that is a little bit more expensive and, and generally not preferred in the U.S., but it is a format that is often pursued um, in foreign uh, countries. So that's just something to know about in terms of a concept for drafting, this, this concept of dependent claims and multiply dependent claims. Okay, so I've laid out Marcouche language, I've, made, I've laid out dependency. So then let's move to an example. Now, this talk is a little bit hard because there's a very large audience and it's hard for you all to raise your hand. So I hope you'll follow along with me. And for those who actually want to um, take, take participate in actually doing it, you're welcome to email me <laughs> your, your thoughts and, and sort of answers to some of these hypotheticals. And I'm happy to engage with you offline about your ideas. But the question here is, what are the different ways we can capture the compounds of interest in a generic way? So in this example, you know, pretend you work in our law firm and someone comes in the door and says, Anita, you know, I've come up with 
at least these four compounds that seem to have interesting activity. I think I'm on to the next blockbuster drug. You know, what should I do? So as for, for the chemists out there um, and, and sort of the small molecule uh, folks uh, who are working in this space, the question is, how do we design a strategy around it? So first question is, how do we do a genus? And so you can imagine that there's, there's no one right way, but there's a lot of different ideas that one can explore. So for example, you know, you can start with this core and you can, you know, list out sort of the backbone right here and then treat certain of the variables as R variables and give a little bit breath to that. You can imagine that you can take an even broader So these are all possibilities. And part of the strategy is figuring out, you know, which one is the appropriate one um, yeah, as part of the portfolio. Uh, is it the broadest approach? Is it the narrowest approach? Is it something in between? And there's various, um, there's various uh, concepts that might drive you to some of those decisions, including prior art. So when you're walking through the door, you know, into my office and asking me about it, uh, from that day before, there's a whole body of prior art. You know, who else is um, designing compounds that are close to the space, and what is publicly out there that might impact? the patentability of what of the case that we're working on. That might lead you to say perhaps the broadest genus is not appropriate, and maybe we need to focus in on one of the narrower genuses to get novelty even. There's a question of the data that you have to support some of these generic formula. Um, you know, this, this genus potentially could cover lots and lots of compounds, but are, did we really enable something as broad as that? So those are some of the considerations. Um, and then there's also a question that you may turn internally to, which is, well, what, what compounds are we working on? And how do we draw a line that can capture the structure activity relationship of the data that we're looking at? And maybe the genus, the line drawing that you, you draw around the compounds that you're making is driven by the activity that you're observing. Meaning you want to capture the compounds that show good activity and draw a line to kind of exclude those that don't work as well or don't work at all. So there's a lot of different strategic um, thoughts that go into this, uh, this exercise. Um, as I said, there's no one right answer. And so part of it is getting that gut instinct um, experience um, and just asking kind of the right questions that may inform, you know, which choice is most appropriate. And, and you don't have to pick one. Maybe you do multiple, you know, um, different scopes for different reasons. But that's sort of the beginnings of how you think about drafting around small molecules. Hey, Anita, there's a question that relates to additional data in support of your um, you know, utility patent application and the timing of that filing. Um, maybe you can take folks through um, the, the questioner is asking about CIPs um, and whatnot, but maybe you can go through that as you talk about the different molecules and when they're identified in the lab and whatnot. Yeah, I think that's really great. And so to put that hypothetical into this time frame and to answer that question all in one, you know, when you walk in the door, we're usually talking about T equals zero, right? We're trying to devise an initial filing. And maybe you literally come to, to me with four compounds that have been made and tested in an assay. Um, and, and you want to develop, you know, a strategy around that. Well, here between zero and 12, that's the time where additional information can um, be pursued. And usually it's by way of a, another provisional. And we can have multiple of those provisionals right up until the 12 month mark. And when let's say we file a PCT, which is an international placeholder application, we can claim priority back to all of those provisionals. And each one of those follow on provisionals will likely have something more, whether it's uh, more data, more compounds, uh, more information on the uses even. So, so that's the timing is that you really wanna try to pack in everything within that 12 month window. Now, you might ask, well, what if my R&D doesn't finish at 12 months? What if I discover something at 14 months? What do I do there? 
And and the and the, the comment there is, well, we'll try our best to pack everything within this window, one year conversion window. But should you have a next generation of technology, you may need a new filing, a new timeline, and preferably before your first case publishes. Because when your first case publishes, it will likely be your closest prior art. And you'll have to be able to argue over your own case about why the next generation of compounds are, are not obvious in view of your previous filings and teachings. So, and then the other question on data that I often get asked is how much, right? I've just talked about four, but what if you had a hundred potential compounds that you're looking to synthesize? How much data is enough to support um, the case? And, and there's no hard and fast rule on that per se. Um, so if we go back to this example, there's no hard and fast rule per se, but the, the law generally says a representative number of examples to support the scope that you're pursuing. And that's not a five, you know, four or 10. It's not a hard number um, in terms of data points, but it has to be re a representative, something that you can argue. So for example, Example, if we take this compound and we, we're focused on, you know, um, I want this R group to be broad, but I've only synthesized maybe these two compounds, then maybe, you know, in the more conservative approach, at best you could do hydrogen or halogen, halo. But if you want to broaden this and say, well, this position could also be a phenol or a bicyclic ring, um, but I haven't ever shown that, this floral compound may have a hard time justifying that broader scope. And it may depend on the particular uh, country's laws and requirements. It may also depend on the luck of the draw in terms of what the examiner is willing to do and not do. Okay, so the answer to the data question is that you typically need a representative number of examples, the more the better. Um, and it typically needs to get into the application. On the concept of CIPs, I think that CIPs um, need to be very carefully used. Instead of filing a CIP, I rather file, uh, going back to my timeline, I rather file a new provisional in, in most instances to give myself a full year to develop that idea. Um, there may be certain instances when a CIP is appropriate, but for the most part, the CIP is, it may not be accorded the date all the way going back to here because it's additional information. So you, the priority that you get is where you first introduce that subject matter with the filing at the patent office. So the CIP, if you file the CIP here, um, you may only get the priority date here. So why not give yourself the benefit of a full timeline to really flesh out that next generation of ideas? Okay, any other questions on that on that front? Okay, um, to touch on now a species claim. So we've been talking about genuses, um, formulas that cover a large number of, uh, or cover a number of compounds. The other claim type to always think about in drafting is one that focuses on sort of the, the picture, the picture claim, the compound of interest. Um, and, and this is an example of a species claim. It's very specific to the compound. Um, and it, uh, it, it's just that one compound and it's salt, pharmaceutically acceptable salt thereof. Okay, so the scope of this is much narrower. And so you may ask yourself, well, what's the point of that? You know, why should, isn't more better? Well, in some ways, perhaps a genus claim will get you coverage over more compounds, and that might give you the benefit of design around, potentially. But the broader your claim, the more susceptible to challenge, if ever um, litigated, right? Because the larger the, the scope that you're pursuing, there's a greater chance that there's prior art. Uh, it may be prior art, not against the compound you're ultimately interested in within that genus, but it could be something on the periphery that could take down that entire claim, okay? So the broader the claim that you have, the more susceptible to challenge. So it's nice to have different claim scopes present in your strategy, right? Some of, some of them may be broad to go after the design around concept, but it's also very valuable to have something that's very specific, that is more bulletproof uh, as compared to a broad genus. Um, and ultimately, this is the, the, the compound that covers the drug that you care about, right? So there's value in a species claim. All right. Um, so here, this is just sort of going back to the example of dependent claims. So we talked about species claim, dependency. The other aspect on claim drafting is to, especially in small molecule cases, is to think about um, sort of the related structures and concepts, and one of which is assault. 
So as you saw on the label, it wasn't just noting that this is the structure of a compound, but rather it was a calcium salt. Um, and so this claim has been drafted to cover pharmaceutically acceptable salts, and then in a dependent claim, call out certain specific salts, sodium salts, calcium salts. And, and perhaps it is the calcium salt that shows unexpected results, whether it be formulation or bio, bio um, availability um, or some other kind of ad advantage that, that sets it apart from other potential salt forms. So salt is a concept that you should pay attention to. Subject wise, um, subject matter wise, another concept is the method of treatment. So going back to the label we were thinking about, what indications is this drug going to be for? And so that opens up the door for this category of claims called method of treatment claims. You'll notice before this claim type is a compound claim or a composition claim. Okay, there are multiple different categories of claims that one can consider compounds and compositions. Um, and then there's methods of treatment, method claims. And the, treat, the method of treatment claim may be drafted to call out a particular indication or a particular mechanism of action of some sort. Um, and they are always tied to uh, sort of the, the language of method of treating something, comprising, and comprising is sort of that transitional word that tells you that this claim will have to include at least whatever comes after the word comprising. And typical of small molecule cases, it's administering the drug to somebody, right? So it's administering to the patient, the subject, the human, the actual compound or salt thereof. So this is your typical method claim. And, and then the subsequent dependent claims may start to call out, um, you know, very specific conditions or indications as, compo as compared to the independent claim that has a broader sort of cluster of indications that are co uh, covered. All right, so I've touched on, um, a, you know, a couple of concepts, whether it be how to cover um, a genus, uh, how to target a species, uh, composition claims versus method claims. And all of this goes to developing an overall claim strategy. And, and really the claims, because the claims are what define the scope of exclusivity at the end of the day, that's typically the section that we, we put the most value on to figure out properly. And then the rest of the application typically falls into place, right? And I typically, um, from a drafting perspective, like to try to settle on the claims with my client and use that as an outline for discussing. And once we settle on that claim strategy, it's fairly routine to kind of fill in the rest of the application with the technical details. Um, those sections do matter, you know, don't get me wrong, they are important, right? The examples will go to supporting the breadth of the claim, will go to supporting written description and enablement of, of the claim scope that I want to go after. The detailed description expands on the variations and possibilities that I want to cover um, and also may provide some useful quote unquote definitions or descriptions that may explain certain te terminology that is being used in the claims. So the rest of the application plays an important role, um, but I like to typically start with the claims because that's really the brains and, and sort of the scope behind the patent. When you think about um, drafting and how to work with a patent practitioner, um, the, the example section is often the section that is most um, uh, familiar to scientists because they are typically very similar to materials and methods section of a journal article. Um, so that's really an area, you know, when we talk about strategies to keep costs down for drafting, you know, this is an area where, um, you know, scientists, people with scientific training can put together this section fairly easily um, to, to be slotted into the right sort of section of a patent application. Um, so that's, this is the example section. And here's another example of sort of the assays um, to kind of support, you know, what these compounds can be used for. All right, I'll pause there before I go into other claim considerations. Uh, Mike, any other questions I can answer at this time? No, keep going. You're good. Okay. Um, all right. So we've now, we've talked about sort of strategies that go around small molecule compounds themselves, but the IP portfolio that surrounds a blockbuster drug is more than just the compound or composition and method of treatment. Um, you want to start thinking about additional fence posts that kind of go with the portfolio. And so other categories um, that 
you can consider include manufacturing, formulation, and expanding on sort of use. And some of this development work in sort of the pharmaceutical kind of timeline of R&D may come later, right? It may come past the T equal 12. In fact, it will likely come past T equals 12. And some of these concepts that we're about to just talk about may be the basis to try to, what people say, evergreen in the portfolio, try to extend the life of the patent. So to just take a pause there, um, a patent, as you remember on the, one of the very early slides, is exclusivity for a certain period of time. And generally speaking, that period of time is 20 years. But there may be reasons why that patent term may be longer due to patent term adjustment or extensions. Um, which are concepts that extend the patent term beyond 20 years. But that 20 years can also be cut short, on the other hand, due to some aspects of law in certain countries um, that find it um, inequitable to extend um, your the life of a patent in view of some earlier cases that could expire earlier. So that's the pro concept of double patenting. So baseline is 20. It could be more, it could be less. So there's always desire in the pharma industry because it takes a long time to develop a drug to think about how do we keep expanding sort of that term of exclusivity. And some of these follow on uh, claim considerations will be will serve as important strategies to potentially ex extend the patent term that surrounds um, a blockbuster drug. Um, so that includes manufacturing. So as you, you know, when in the early on in the development process, the medicinal chemist may come up with sort of a dirty, simple and dirty, you know, uh, synthetic scheme that works well on the milligram to gram scale. But as you move through the development process into commercial scale on the kilo and multi kilo scale, you know, the synthesis may change. And, and maybe the chemistry is challenging. And maybe there's certain aspects that are really challenging that if you patent can serve as value to block competitors to get to where they need to be with the API, the active uh, pharmaceutical ingredient. So you want to think about whether there are opportunities to cover the underlying chemistry synthesis, purification. Think about, are, are there some key intermediates that if you patent will sort of block the route to get to the compound of interest? And then other um, ideas, you know, often that we'd like to discuss is what are the challenges um, in the manufacturing side of things when it comes to, you know, working on very large scales. So that's one area that you can continue the discussion uh, on to try to develop more IP. Another one is the formulation work. So once you know that candidate is being you know put through the development pipeline uh, and and focus and resources are devoted to that development. Um, formulation work will happen. So you start to ask, well, maybe this, this compound is not that easy to put in tablet form. Or maybe the um, uh, sort of bioavailability of the of the compound is not great for, for the for the mechanism in which it operates within the human body. And so are there ways to try to address that in the way it's formulated um, in the choices of excipients? Um, maybe you're looking at some sort of um, pro drug strategy, right? Um, Maybe it is uh, a formulation that has to do with time release and, and how you design the formulation to achieve that. Maybe it's you start off with a tablet but realize that there are other modes of administration and making a switch from one mode to another is a non-trivial, you know, scientific change. Um, and so those all those ideas become, you know, great grounds to try to grow and build the portfolio around the compound. Then there's also the use side of things. So the method of treatment is the beginnings of you know, covering the indication of interest. But as you go through the clinical process, you, know, you may start to discover, well, maybe certain patient populations are the ones that I target unexpectedly well. Maybe it's that there's a certain dosing regimen that is really needed for this drug. Um, and you've, you've kind of unlocked those concepts you know, later on. Maybe there's a biomarker piece to it that is valuable uh, just from the rolling out of how this will get administered and, and prescribed and all of that. And then there's also combination therapies, right? Is there um, a use for this drug in combination with others um, that uh, can have unexpected you know, advantages and benefits? So those are all aspects that one can explore to try to keep growing the portfolio. So Anita, we've got a few questions that have come in. Um, first, what, what would happen if you had a patented API and then a competitor uh, 
develops a much better time release with clear clinical benefits? How does that play out? Well, I think that um, it's a problem, but but you have to realize that if your um, patent for the underlying compound is still in force, so I think we should probably talk about it in two scenarios. First scenario, your patent, your underlying compound coverage is in force, uh, is still is still alive and in force. The other competitor will need access, right, to your IP covering the compound itself to be able to, um, you know, market their formulation, right? So in that instance. If the compound coverage still exists, your competitor is unlikely to embark on this effort because they'll need access to your IP to have freedom to operate, right? To be able to pursue their, their plans for that formulation. But if we take a different scenario and say that this, this the underlying compound is covered by really old cases that have expired, then you're looking at sort of really the follow-on IP strategy, whoops. Um, which is going to, you know, maybe we have a new formulation that can help us. Um, and, and so the underlying compound coverage is no longer a problem because the patent has expired. And so if, if that's the type of company and strategy, business strategy that you have, then the competitor's work could be a problem. Um, and so the question is, you know, uh, do you need access to their IP to be continue what you're doing? Um, you know, can you, if you're in a foot race with the other folks, then there may be just the consideration of we need to file our IP and get our strategy in place faster than our competitors. So I think the answer to that really depends on more facts, which is, you know, is the compound case still in force or not? If it is, your competitor can't really do much without access to your patent. Um, and you can sue them and stop them. Um, but if the underlying compound case is expired and there's no other kind of IP that could be blocking to your competitors, then um, that, that becomes a risk. There's a question about deuterated versions of compounds, Anita, and whether yep. you can broaden claims with mm -hmm. that yeah. or potentially design around somebody else's claim by the deuterated version. Yeah, so I think that this kind of gets us to that second generation patents, um, where we start talking about new salt, new polymorphs, and other forms, which for me, the other forms include deuterated forms, that could potentially be very valuable, especially, um, and those cases are not easy. These second generation cases in small molecules are not trivial, because most of the time, what has happened is, and going back to my very early timeline, most of the time, the compound case um, will have published. And a lot of this downstream work happens after the publication. So if you're in a situation where you discover a new polymorph after 18 months or realize that the deuterated forms um, uh, you know, have some value, um, you're gonna have to work against your own earlier case to try to get patentability. So um, those subsequent filings directed to new salt forms, new polymorphs, deuterated forms, other forms, um, really need to have a story behind it if you really are interested in getting the patent granted. Now, other folks will take a different kind of approach to how they think about the role of the IP in their portfolio. Maybe you simply want to muddy the water for everyone else, and you really don't care so much about all those forms, but you don't want to be blocked from it. So you kind of put it out there and say, here's all the other forms that we can make, and if we can get the patent for it, then great. But at the end of the day, you know, what we care about isn't one of those alternative forms. So it's, there's a little bit of thinking behind what the role and strategy of that case is within your portfolio. Um, but many of the times it's really important um, to have a story behind, you know, a new polymorph. Um, you discovered that maybe, um, you know, form A that you discover it is much more um, easy to manufacture with as compared to form C that you had discovered. And so you want to develop a, a polymorph strategy around that. Same thing with the deuterated. Maybe there are certain positions that if you deuterate actually are helpful. Um, maybe sometimes the deuterated um, analogs may play different roles from the scientific perspective, and you want to try to develop a story around that. There's a question on evergreening, Anita, about you know, identifying active isomers of racemic mi mixtures and how that might not be obvious. How do you deal with that? I think that that question is really a science question um, more than anything. So uh, it's hard to answer that question in the abstract because I do think it is highly dependent on what the science story is. 
But, you know, if for some reason um, you're able to say uh, a particular isomer, you know, it, it is more uh, easily formulated, for example, and isolating that isomer is not trivial, maybe there's some potential IP around that. Um, and so you really need to drill down into the science and, and tease out what is the story behind, um, you know, uh, this, this, this finding. Um, and most of the time you're working against the publication of the earlier filings, maybe the one that first disclosed the compound um, that you have to distinguish from. So really it, it is a matter of storytelling is like how I like to frame it. Um, it's not a slam dunk because there's a question of, well, isn't this obvious, right? People know that you can have isomers of a known compound now. Um, so what is, why is this particular isomer um, important? Why is a composition having a, a high percentage of purity for that isomer important? Is it tied to the formulation? Is it tied to the synthesis, um, et cetera? So you just have to develop a story around it, but all of those are good um, observations and should be explored. Also a question on trade secrets in small molecules. You know, are there any? Um, and if so, you know, what about, you know, method of making and the best mode requirements and, and that interaction? Yeah, I think that the trade secrets more often than not come in sort of the manufacturing side of things. Um, that's, I think, one area where, you know, if you choose to disclose um, a certain degree about the manufacturing route, you know, there's always some tricks, you know, or some know-how that, that, that is related to the manufacturing side of the things that you may choose to keep as trade secrets. I think that this question, you know, just raises that bigger question of how do you deal with trade secrets versus patents overall? Um, and that is something that is worth asking about. In the life sciences, in particular pharma space, the other place to pay attention to is not just sort of science journal articles and our own patent filings, but also sort of the information that gets to the public via the regulatory regime. So there may be certain pieces of information that by virtue of FDA type requirements, you have to disclose to the public. So if that information is going to be out there, you may as well consider monopolizing on it from a patent strategy perspective. So that's like another variable that you can throw into the mix of, you know, is something worth keeping as a trade secret or not. But typically, you know, one area I can think of is on the manufacturing side, um, where, you know, maybe you don't tell everyone, it could be that you don't tell everyone the entire route, and maybe you try to patent some of the key steps and keep certain things um, uh, sort of, uh, you know, less revealed to the public. Uh, those, I think those details are to be discussed, but it's a good question. And it's always a question you should ask uh, before you put together a patent filing that innately by the process will make known to the public how to actually make and use, you know, the information in that case. So a question, Anita, about um, small molecules developed, provisional patent application is filed, but it's not converted after the 12 month period. Can this molecule be rescued in some way later on? Um, and I think when you answer that, I think it'd be helpful to talk about the, the drugs where they've sorted out, you know, they, they were going with drugs to, well, why don't you answer that question and then I'll ask another one, the, the follow-on. So answer this first one and okay. then I'll, I'll get to the, what I'm asking on the second one. Okay, so I wanna make sure I understood the question correctly. So at T equals zero, we file on like, let's say hundred compounds mm -hmm. and some of, and, and that hundred compounds, none of them turn out to be a value in that we don't, none of them get selected to move forward ultimately. That's the scenario we're talking about? Correct, yeah. Okay, so, so just to be clear in this timeline, you file something at T equals zero, the, let's say it's a US provisional application. That application um, does not get examined. All it does is secure a filing date. Let's say we filed it today. It would be today's date for the subject matter that's disclosed in that filing. And if you end up not doing anything at the 12 month mark, meaning you don't turn it into a version that does get examined and you let it go abandoned, no one will ever find out about it, okay? Um, but if you end up converting it, then that application, everything in that priority application, everything in this application will become publicly available around 18 months. So with that said, um, 
oftentimes out of the hundred compounds, you know, there may be a subset that actually do make it through and a subset that don't make it through. And unfortunately it's kind of an all or nothing in terms of um, the filing, right? So if you packed all a hundred compounds into this filing and there was a subset that didn't work out and you didn't really want to disclose it to the public, you don't have a choice. If you wanted to rely on this application for your priority at T equals zero for the stuff that you do care, all of it comes with it. Okay, because at 18 months, this will be published. So that leads to sort of a, a separate kind of drafting strategy um, sort of consideration, which is perhaps we should have done two filings here, you know, one to maybe the 30 compounds that we thought were really promising. And then the balance would have cap be captured in a separate um, application. And if we decide at T equals 12, all of them were of value, then you'd claim priority to both. If you decided at T equals, um, 12, uh, T equals 12, only the first application with the 30 compounds are worth converting, then you can do that and you can let the second filing go abandoned. So you start to play with a little bit more nuanced strategies um, with that concept in mind. Um, but the, the bottom line is if you put something in a priority and you plan to rely on it, it will become publicly available at 18 months. Otherwise, you could let it go and no one will ever find out about it. So I'll, I'll just answer my question rather than trying to pose it. And that is there are uh, strategies involved with drugs where um, they failed in their clinical trials for whatever reason. There was a, you know, a subset of the population that had adverse reactions. So they had to pull the, the drug. One thing that has happened, and we've seen this, is that, that now with diagnostics and, and an ability to sort of screen patients and identify which patients you should give the drug to and not give the drug to, you can come back with some old molecule and seek patent protection for which would include a, a selection step. That is, you, you perform your diagnostic, you select those patients out which shouldn't get the drug, or you just select those patients which should get the drug. It depends on how you want to phrase that claim. And then you administer that old drug to those patients. Now, that's eminently patentable in a way that you can revive an old drug that was just not good for a small subset of the patients, but taken out of clinical trials because it was you know, having real adverse effects. If you can screen those folks out in an early step, that's a, a patentable element to your claim that you can add. Yeah, and I think it goes to some of these other buckets, um, like subpatient population is one of the buckets that were right here, patient population, right? So I think it's, it's recognizing that um, maybe there's a subset of folks who can really benefit from it. Uh, but there's a lot of different, I mean, that's one of many strategies. So I think it's definitely the takeaway is whatever scientific observation is interesting on the scientific level, whatever challenges get solved, those are the points that are worth raising and discussing with your patent folks, because those, um, the solutions to those observations and problems often are great sources for potential patentability. Um, so I think that's, to me, the bigger takeaway is even, you know, if there's something interesting like that, I would like to know about it. And there's a, a seems to be a question just on what's this cost? And, you know, what would, you know, drafting a, a, a good patent application typically cost? I think that on small molecules, um, it really depends, right? Some cases, um, small molecule cases may only cover four, five, six compounds. Others may cover hundreds of compounds. So you can imagine that the cost differential and, and the effort amount to do that is different. But I would say, you know, it, it probably is on the order of 15 to 20,000, you know, as, as just sort of a baseline average starting point. Um, some cases are maybe really complicated in view of the prior art. So maybe you need to invest some money up front to do a proper prior art search to understand, you know, what genus is appropriate and what kind of um, areas you can um, uh, pursue and carve out and all of that. So I, it's an order of magnitude. We're not talking necessarily 100K, although some of the biggest cases, you know, could be that amount. Um, but it's also not three or 4,000. I think if you uh, spend very little on it, you may not have developed the ideas, the patent strategy enough to be able to maneuver around the potential problems that can come your way. And so 
in, in the chemistry world, it is important um, if you start to think about not just the US rules, but the rules in different countries like Europe and China, their written description requirements are different and arguably, arguably more stringent in some ways than the US. And so if you're positioning your IP for a global strategy, you'll want to have thought through some of those uh, issues so that you actually have the description support to pivot as you go through examination in some of those foreign jurisdictions. So that gives you an order of magnitude. Anita, there's a question about um, non-publication requests in the US and how those go about, you know, can you keep your stuff secret and, and how do you go about doing that? So non-publication requests comes with strings. Um, by using a non-publication request, um, at the time of filing, uh, there's a box that you check on the um, data sheet that goes with the application. You give up your foreign filing rights. So it's not something, um, you know, it's not something that you often will want to do for something that is really important for which you want global coverage, right? So you're giving up that whole part of the portfolio for the ability to keep it quiet for a little bit of time. It takes 18 months before it publishes. So that's sort of the minimum that you get to kind of preserve um, sort of the secrecy. Um, you know, part of the discussion is the foreign filing piece. Um, but maybe you're in a situation for whatever reason, maybe it's based on indication, maybe it's for business reasons that the U.S. is the major market and you don't really care about the foreign rights. So maybe under that scenario, that may be an appropriate strategy to add to kind of your overall approach. Um, but that's the main drawback behind it. And then once you get to a place where you're, you're about to grant, I mean, then it gets revealed to the public. So it's not going to stay silent forever. Um, but I think the foreign filing piece is a key driver uh, and sort of the rationale and how you decide and arrive at doing a non-pub request um, needs to be thought through carefully. Um, but it is, a, it is a tool that is part of a strategy. It just depends on the situation and what you're using it for. Can you redact information from a provisional? Does that do you any good? Uh, I mean, no, you can't, because as I said, if you're going to rely on it as a priority application, this whole application will get triggered to be published when the application publishes. So there's no redacting. So the thing you need to pay attention to, and often when we have those discussions with our client, is to double check, like, there's no, nothing you intended to keep a trade secret here because there's no deleting it. If uh, The only way you can prevent that trade secret from getting out is if you let that application go. And by that, you also let go the priority date associated with that filing. Okay, you can continue. Um, let's see. I think I may have been towards the end of my, um, okay. So the last slide that I have, and that many of you will be able to uh, obtain copies of this is a hypothetical, a take home exercise. And as I said, you're, you're welcome to um, try this exercise and then email me your answer. Uh, and I'm happy to talk to you about it. But the hypothetical take home exercise is that you've got some med chem, Med medicinal chemists at pharma company who shared with you these four compounds. And um, they indicated that these compounds may have activity for hair loss in men. And so the question is, can you come up with a claim set to protect these compounds and their uses? And if there are any questions that you wanted to ask to the scientist to try to further refine your claim set, you know, feel free to, to raise them in your claim set. But that's the take home exercise. And I hope that some of you, many of you will give it a try and, and my inbox will be flooded with genuses and species claims and method of treatment claims. <laughs> um, but that's really the, uh, I think, end of the presentation. Um, and then I do notice that there are a handful of um, questions uh, that have been bubbled up as well. There's one. So, Anita up here that uh, Jennifer is asking if you could share your path to patent law. How did, how did you become oh, a sure. patent lawyer? Sure. So um, I started, as I said, as a chemistry major in college. Um, and uh, I spent some time in industry following um, undergrad. 
Um, so I was at Pfizer. I was a process chemist for a couple of years, um, but really got to interact with the different kind of parts of the drug development process from medicinal chemists to formulation, all the way to, you know, owning my own hard hat so that I could, uh, you know, work on the big, big scale um, plants. Um, and then from there, I knew I always wanted to uh, go to graduate school of some sort. And so um, I was debating between getting a PhD and actually jumping ship to do something completely different. And I ended up um, just deciding to go to law school. So no one in my family is a lawyer, so I'm the first. Um, but I took a, a chance <laughs> at doing something a little bit different. Um, and from there, um, I just really wanted to continue leveraging my passion for science. And so um, to marry that up, you know, I thought intellectual property law would be a good starting point. Um, and it was through law school, my first summer um, after law school, that I um, landed at Morrison and Forrester and had the opportunity to work with Mike uh, and the team here at MoFo. Uh, and that's really how it all began. And I've found that this career is incredibly rewarding in the sense that I get to work with a lot of different technologies, right? Today, my talk is on small molecule, but I've had the pleasure, uh, you know, of working across many different technologies, including medical devices, diagnostics, uh, materials, ag, food, um, and sort of the gamut. Uh, and, and that's by choice, partly because I just really enjoy different technologies and, and um, you know, like to in intellectually engage with that diversity. Um, I've also, you know, um, this talk is very specific to patent prosecution, patent filings, and sort of the patent world, but I've also had um, the uh, ability and opportunity to explore IP-related kind of areas of law, including technology transactions, so working on license agreements, um, different types of agreements, joint development agreements, and the transactional side of intellectual property, um, and I did that for several years and continue to counsel my clients in that area. Um, but also have had the opportunity to team up with um, various litigators within the firm to support their cases on patent litigation. So a lot of the work that I do on the litigation side continues to refine and inform the way I think about building IP portfolios. Because at the end of the day, if my, if my clients are successful, they will get sued and they will be litigating these cases. And I want to make sure that we're thinking about it strategically enough such that these patents will withstand that test. Um, and so the litigation experience um, is related you know, to patent. Um, and I think it's, uh, it opens up sort of my eyes to uh, what a different group of folks in our firm you know, worry about day to day and to support them with the technology background that I have, the patent pa prosecution background that I have uh, leads to very interesting kind of projects and um, tackling very high stakes, but very uh, interesting issues as well. That's great. Thanks, Anita. Um, does not appear we have any more questions, so we'll see everybody next week. Um, and please contact us if you're interested in office hours. We're happy to set those up. Um, otherwise, have a great week, and we'll see you next time. Thank you.